So we're going to start. <laughs> um, thank you for coming to the first panel of uh, the Weird Reality in the Mount Art and Code Conference. Um, this is the context and conditions for independent world making panel. Uh, I'm your moderator, and I'm also a visiting assistant professor of art here at SAMU. I'm Angela Washka. Uh, this panel is focused on people and institutions who create context for new media and now VR projects and um, aims to look at the ecology of the VR field from institutional um, to even DIY. And before we get started with the discussion, um, I'll briefly go over the structure for the panel. Um, so first, I'll quickly introduce each of our various esteemed panelists and give you a bit of their um, biographical and information accolades alliances and so on. Um, and then they will each have a couple of minutes to go into a little bit more detail about who they are, what they do, their relationship to VR, and what institutions they represent, if any. Um, and then I'll introduce a couple of discussion topics and we'll have a, a bit of a conversation followed by some time for audience uh, questions at the end. And before I start, I wanted to thank um, Golan, Tom Hughes, and Lauren Goshinsky, who's actually on this panel. Um, for, yeah, yay, let's thank all of them <laughs> for um, all of the other work putting together this uh, pretty ambitious conference, as well as Ingrid Kopp, Jason Epping, Jackson Luca, Kalani Nicole, and Winslow Porter, who are all here in front of you, um, for being able to be here in Pittsburgh for this conversation. So, yay! <laughs> yeah, more fun. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself and each of the panel members. Uh, so, in addition to being a visiting professor here, I'm an artist and curator and writer. Um, most relevant to the content of this conference, I make performances and interventions in existing multiplayer ritual game environments. Um, these performances often involve facilitating discussions focused on inclusivity and communal language formation um, inside game spaces, and ultimately led to the formation of the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness in World of Warcraft, which is a four-year-long project inside that massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Um, and I'll start with uh, Lauren Gershinsky. Uh, Lauren Gushinsky is a curator, event producer, and artist who creates platforms for experiencing emerging music and new media art. As the co-founder and director of VIA, Lauren works between musicians and visual artists to create custom audiovisual performances, commission new works, and create programs that expand what a festival can be for both artists and audiences. VIA is a member of the International Cities of Advanced Sound Network and has received attention from Thump, Red Bull Music Academy, The Creators Project, Huffington Post, Dummy Magazine, and Cool Hunting, among many others. Lauren also DJs and is a contributor to the all-female art collective Dad Franks, who are awesome. I wrote that, she didn't. <laughs> the VIA Festival is happening this evening and through this weekend, so I hope you'll check it out um, along with this conference. Lauren also co-curated this conference, so we are very lucky to have her in Pittsburgh. I'm very thankful. Ingrid Kopp is a senior consultant for the interactive department at the Tribeca Film Institute. She's worked in independent film for over 15 years with a special focus on the intersections of documentary storytelling, social media, and technology. Um, previously, she was director of the Tribeca Film Institute interactive department, supporting interactive cross-platform projects through the TFI New Media Fund and TAA Interactive Prototype Fund. She created Tribeca Hacks and TFI Interactive to create a space for story and tech and design experiments and conversation. She presently curates Storyscapes for the Tribeca Film Festival. Before her work at Tribeca, she was editorial administrator at the documentaries department at Channel 4 Television in the UK and ran Shooting People, a US filmmaking network. Jason Epping is the curator of digital media at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York City. His work at the museum revolves around participation in a variety of fields, including video games, interactive art, remix, animation, and online communities. Additionally, Epic is a senior agent with Frank Group in Front Everywhere and a member of the art collective Flux Factory. Jack Saluka became director of media arts at the National Endowment for the Arts, or commonly known as the NEA, in January of 2016. In this position, she manages the NEA's grant-making activities for arts organizations across the country working in media arts, which includes film, video, audio, interactive, and other electronic media. 
Her field experience includes 12 years working at the intersection of arts and community building as an artist, administrator, and educator. Prior to joining the NEA, she was executive director of Squeaky Wheel Film and Media Arts Center, an artist-run organization in Buffalo, New York. Kalani Nicole is an independent curator and user-centered design specialist. She is the owner and director of Transfer, an exhibition space that explores the friction between network studio practice and its physical instantiation. The gallery supports artists working with computer-based practices to realize solo exhibitions in New York City and travels internationally, promoting new formats for exhibition and appreciation of contemporary art. And finally, Winslow Porter is a Brooklyn-based director, creative technologist, and producer who has always been fascinated with the possibilities of how the intersection of art and technology can elevate storytelling. With over five years of experiential and digital agency experience, he's created experiences for TED, Google, Delta, Diesel, and Merrill. He produced the Tribeca Film Festival Transmedia award-winning virtual reality documentary Clouds, among other projects. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, each panelist to let them expand a little bit on what they do, and then we'll move on to the discussion. So if we can start with Lauren Goshinsky. Is this working? Working, working, working. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, okay, where do we start? <laughs> I, uh, I am the co-founder and director of Via Festival, as it says up there. And I, I'd like to give you just a quick history of, of how and why uh, I started VIA with my collaborator, Quinn Leonowitz, um, and a whole bunch of people in Pittsburgh. Uh, there was essentially uh, a gap here that we were seeing, that there were tons of amazing musicians and artists working you know, across like, various platforms, uh, but all interested in kind of like the advancement of like, adventurous music, adventurous digital art, and the intersection of those things. And, uh, and that's kind of how VIA formed. It started as a festival in 2010, uh, which was an overly ambitious, uh, pretty crazy attempt, uh, but it seems like we keep doing that every year, so it's just like part of the course. Uh, but yeah, and we started as a festival, and we you know, kind of expanded from there, uh, doing, doing projects year-round, like we'll do commissions uh, in partnership with the Carnegie Museum, or co-present programming with the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh or uh, through our International Center of Advanced Sound, or sorry, our ICAST uh, network. You know, we'll travel and I'll travel and do talks and, you know, so it's expanded outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, and we also bring a lot of artists in through Pittsburgh. So on the music side, uh, we were really interested in premiering artists here that have never played in Pittsburgh before. Um, and that's breaking artists not just into Pittsburgh, but on like a national or global scene. Um, so you'll see like a lot of up and coming names or like hot names coming through VIA. Um, and you'll also see like a lot of legacy acts. I think we're really interested in, in drawing a line between like what's going on right now, but also where that came from. So just for example, this year, um, we have ESG, which is a seminal post-punk band from the Bronx. They've never played in Pennsylvania before, and they're gonna play at VIA. Um, but we kind of have a whole day built around that of like uh, Juliana Huxtable's part of that day, uh, this, this other punk band that's really young named Inaco. So we try to draw a line between all the artists that come here. And that's on the music side. And on the, on the visual side, what we try to do um, is play matchmaker. So we're really interested in the live and performative aspect of, of visual art or digital art, and it always centers around these like. Uh, duos that we put together. So what you're seeing up there is last year uh, we paired Jesse Lanza with um, with actually like kind of a super team of students from CMU, and uh, they designed like the video and media for performance. That's actually a 360 like inverted boxing ring that we did in a former uh, Moose Lodge. So people actually can stand in the round around her performance, and that was something really interesting um, to experience. So just to set the tone of like kind of the spaces we like to work in, the artists we like to work with, and how we like to put them together. Uh, so really quick, we can maybe move on to the video. This was, uh, to give you an idea of what we do, moving into more uh, VR territory. This was in 2014. Um, this was called ASMR NPC. This was a project that um, I kind of came up with, but I was, uh, I kind of executed it in collaboration with Laturbo Avedon, who's an artist that's an avatar. 
and uh, this uh, YouTube personality, Brittany ASMR. So, uh, kind of going back into context, we our pop-up site for the festival that year was um, this giant Gilded Age building downtown. It's a huge historical site called the Union Trust. And there's this big rotunda in the center. And we uh, erected a dome, and inside of that dome, we kind of had this VR spa, ASMR treatment center for you. And then, mind you, this is like 2014, so this is kind of like my first foray into saying like, all right, I'm gonna try to direct something like in VR. And I think still it's very much a, a pilot or a test. I wouldn't say that this is like, you know, some fantastically finished project, but it was a, it was a great it was a great test, especially doing it in a festival context, because uh, it was kind of where you could go to escape uh, and have a really private moment with yourself and these two characters that uh, are real artists and are real people. But uh, what you're watching here is a simulation of actually moving up through the atrium in the space. So we were really interested in kind of referencing the actual space that you're in while still having this quote unquote virtual experience. And we were really interested in um, like all the sonic elements of that, you know, like how, how sound works in virtual reality, uh, how you can have full body experiences that go beyond your eyes. Uh, and so the dome itself uh, mimicked that, you know, like the acoustics of a dome, you can, you can sit across from someone in like a 30 foot dome and whisper and they can hear you. So inside the VR experience, you're, you're having this, uh, there's the dome, you're having like, you know, this, uh, this kind of like sonically driven exploration and then outside of the VR experience, it's being mirrored in the dome. So that's just kind of a quick overview of, of the kind of stuff we get into. Uh, hi, my name is Jake Snepping. As Angela said, I'm the curator of digital media at the Museum of Moving Image in New York City. Uh, the museum is dedicated to the moving, the moving image in all its forms. That's film, television, and uh, digital media. That's how the museum breaks it down. Of course, that last third uh, accounts for more and more uh, every year. Um, I specifically organize these exhibitions about art, play, and vernacular culture. And uh, the slide that Angela chose is from uh, an exhibition that I recently organized, a very serious exhibition about internet cats called How Cats Took Over the Internet. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, if, I hope you got to see Michael's, uh, Michael Neymar's uh, uh, keynotes. I, I'm really thankful that he uh, sort of highlighted the long history of immersive uh, media and, and um, sort of all the predecessors for um, sort of the recent uh, VR moment that we have now. And he also mentioned that we, we have uh, in, in our collection um, his uh, Seeing Bam piece. So the, the um, VR is definitely a part of what we do uh, at the museum as much as sort of resources and uh, uh, the sort of structure the museum allows. Um, what you're looking at right now is uh, a couple photos from uh, an exhibition that I helped organize in 2012 uh, called Space War, uh, Video Games Blast Off. And it was looking at uh, the history of video games, uh, uh, taking Space War, the first video game, which was developed at MIT, as a departure point um, and this manifesto that uh, the creators wrote, um, which had sort of three parts of it, one of it being about sort of how technology drives uh, media and video games. And so a important part of that exhibition was looking at um, the ways that video games specifically uh, are often drivers of technological innovation. So this is a virtual boy from uh, the mid-90s. Um, I think that's sort of lost in a lot of the histories that we tell about virtual reality. And the next next slide is a Tommy Tronic story. Is there? No. Oh, there's, there was another game in there from the 80s called Tommy Tronics, which is sort of a 3D. Um, I don't remember like the Tiger Electronics toys and sort of LCD things. It's a sort of 3D version of that um, that's also sort of left out in these histories. Um, I think we were the first public exhibition of the, of the Oculus. Um, this happened in 2013 uh, at NDK East, an uh, annual festival that we put on in collaboration with NDK. Um, and of course, virtual reality is a very important part of that as well, because there's a lot of uh, interesting independent video games that are coming out of that. Um, next slide. Um, and then an exhibition that we put together called Century Stories, which was um, put together in collaboration with the company uh, Future of Storytelling, which is also doing an event right now in New York. Um, so this is a, a recent exhibition from, uh, I think it was 2014. Um, so right now we're showing uh, Way to Go, probably one of my favorite VR experiences, but it's more set. Um, Clouds of Procedura, uh, History of Verse, I forget the other fourth one. Um, and then one more slide. Um, this is Berkeley. Has anyone experienced Berkeley? Yeah, um, a really interesting experiment in um, sort of, you know, not just uh, visual, uh, but other 
sort of sensory uh, um, experiences. So you, you strap in um, with an Oculus headset and you flap your wings and you fly over a cityscape. Um, it was developed at the University of Zurich um, and I think premiered at Sundance in 2015. 2015, yeah. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of highlight a few examples of, of how we're um, showing VR at the museum and, and thinking through that. So that's me. Um, my name is Kalani Nicole. I founded Transfer Gallery. Um, we had our first exhibition in March of 2013. So um, in the past three and a half years, I've done a number of solo exhibitions and also been developing new formats in the market. Um, I put together some slides from exhibitions just to get a feel. Uh, you can get a feel for what the, the gallery is all about if you don't know us. Um, so I collaborate with artists to explore new exhibition formats for computer-based practices. This was an early show I did with uh, Rick Silva. We were exploring how you can display serial images in a gallery. So these were giant poster-sized takeaways that you could just peel them off these pedestals and take them with you. Um, my background was uh, curating with a collective in Philadelphia where I developed some specialty in net art. Um, and I would produce these big group-focused exhibitions. Now that um, I run Transfer, I'm focused on four main activities. One of them is solo exhibitions. So a lot of what you're seeing here are you know, giving over an entire space to an artist to explore something new coming from their studio. Um, this is a show from Claudia Mate, a data-driven show. Uh, this is a, a show from Rosa Meckman, and one of the things that happens when you give an artist all of the space is the space transforms every time, and that's something I love to work with an artist to think about how we can move away from the walls and really create um, an experience around new forms of media work. Um, this is an artist, Joshua Caleb Wiley, who turned my gallery into an e-waste collection facility for the run of the show. Um, and the community came and dropped things and we worked with the Lower East Side Ecology Center to remove all the e-waste at the end of the show. So really looking for people who will activate the space in a way that's interesting and going to provide some context for a practice that might otherwise be screen-based and very one-on-one. -on -one. How can we create shared experiences around that kind of work? Um, this is Lorna Mills, a large-scale GIF installation I did in my space where I hung way too many TVs on the wall to create these sort of large um, moving image collages. That's just a little bit of a detailed view. Um, and this is my first exhibition that I did to support virtual reality work. Um, this is the Demoda, and it's a virtual institution. Um, so this is a project from Al Alfredo Salazar Caro. <clears throat> what he's really interested in doing is um, <clears throat> working with artists who are maybe doing 3D modeling um, and working in virtual um, space construction, but who haven't yet engaged with Unity. So the museum almost acts as a platform to help artists install in the VR space, and they're really working closely with studios to think about things like um, gravity and scale and movement and some of the finer points of virtual reality. So I find this is a great way to support this kind of work and touch a number of artists all at once. Um, and this is a, an example of how a collector might acquire this work and display it in their home. There's a, bit, a little bit of an artifact that comes with it, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in the panel later on. Um, so um, I just want to at this point say that I'm really interested in supporting artists working in VR because I'm really moved by the medium, and I, I see the, the virtual future coming into full view, and I think it's really important that artists are empowered to, to work with this technology and um, have that be really open to whatever a studio is interested in. Um, so finding ways for them to have resources that would rival you know, corporations or game design labs, I think, is a huge uh, priority of mine. And moving into 2017, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the market. Um, so this is an example of uh, some more large format work, Claudia Hart's The Doll's House. This was a 28-foot projection installation that we did in the gallery. And this is the current <laughs> exhibition, Angela Washka's The Game, The Game. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the gallery's activity in the contemporary art market. Um, I've done a number of exhibitions in fairs um, and also doing some pop-ups. So I'm building markets for new formats, um, software pieces, Unity apps, different video games like Angela Washko's um, experience, animated GIFs, uh, 3D printed sculpture, net art, 4K video, and hopefully more and more VR and AR artworks. Um, this was a performance-based piece I did that was quite disruptive at the Pulse Art Fair. The other gallerists did not like these girls in their underwear covered in glitter taking selfies in their boots, but it was interesting. Um, this was the large-scale GIF installation we did in Times Square as part of the Midnight Moment. 
is the work of Lorna Mills. It was huge and awesome. To be fair, these were videos. Their gifts had to be translated into videos. I just looked up their screen. Um, I also took um, some work to the NADA in New York this year, and there were actually two VR works in that same fair. Rachel Rosen, who I think is a participant at this festival, and then Brenna Murphy had a piece also. So that's happening more and more. I was just reading today also about the freeze in London. Right now there's a massive booth um, with all computers and headsets from John Raffman there, um, 17 Gallery. Next slide. This was something more recently where I'm trying to do pop-ups and travel work um, and do a little bit more patron development. I myself am also building a collection um, and I'm, I'm hoping to make that more public and kind of lead by example and speak to my peers working in technology about how to live um, with these new forms of work. Um, and so that's my, my concluding point is I just wanted to say, you know, I know many of you are students here, but for anyone who um, is investing in technologies, hardware, software, um, for VR development, I think it's crucial that they also develop, I'm sorry, they also invest in VR artworks. Um, I think the artists working in VR are really giving new shape to the virtualization of our human experience. and. It's a really worthwhile um, and valuable part of the investment. Since this is an unconference, I was wondering if I could get over there and, and oh, do it yeah. from your microphone because I've got a few slides. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Oh, it's too. Cool. Hey, everyone. Oh, that's a nice slide, too, from Clouds. Um, so, can I just go forward here? Hey, everyone. So, this one's Love Porter. Um, I'll just give you, a, I guess, a background. I went to school for film and music and technology, and then I became an editor in New York, so I was working at a place called Goldcrest, where actually I met Milica, who I'm collaborating with now. She's in the back there. I worked on a, on a movie called Noise, uh, which uh, you don't need to see it. That's fine. Uh, and then we did a, we've also done music videos uh, together, Milica and I. That's Anthony, Anthony the Johnson's video. And after I realized that I wanted to sort of, I was always the kid, who could fix the VCR in my household. So I realized that, hey, maybe I'm actually you know, interested in doing technology and art. Uh, so I went to ITP, which I'm sure there's some, some ITPers out here, or also at the conference in general. And uh, after graduating from there, I ended up uh, becoming a creative technologist and also a producer, working at the Barbarian Group, which the C++ framework Cinder uh, was being developed uh, with Andrew Bell. That was a great opportunity. And then I worked uh, as a creative technologist at MKG. I actually worked with Barry on a project indirectly. If he's there, Barry's in the audience. There he is. Um, and then I also, when I was there, worked with Kyle McDonald and Lauren McCarthy on some installations at TED, uh, as you can see in the lower, uh, lower right there, uh, two different ones we did. And also worked on stuff for Clinton Global Initiative. And while I was doing stuff in the agency world, I also uh, produced clouds uh, which some of you might have uh, seen, and also that was that a lot of that, uh, a lot of the work from Clouds uh, was started here actually about six years ago at the festival. So it's exciting to be here. Uh, and then the current project I'm working on with Milica is a project called Giant. It's a virtual reality installation uh, or experience, we should say. We've been touring a lot. I think this is maybe our 15th uh, conference showing it, which has been great because it's right now the only way we can show it is actually by putting headsets on people. So we we say it's been like touring in a band. But instead of playing a whole concert, we're playing one song to three people every eight minutes. So it's an interesting experience, uh, definitely. And we're hopefully going to be distributing that very soon. Uh, and I can uh, tell you a little bit about what it's about. So here is Giant. You, you get placed inside of a basement with a family that is in a war zone. Uh, the two parents are trying to convince their daughter that the loud bombs that are approaching is in fact a giant that wants to play with her. And we had to use some interesting techniques, the same techniques we actually used for clouds, but a slightly different version of it, uh, where we shot on a green screen. You can see in the background that famous checkerboard pattern, which is used for the depth kit, uh, which is actually the workshop that's going on in the building as well. Uh, we shot with a red 5K sensor. The actors are a little, uh, they only have about three feet deep by eight feet wide to interact. And then we composite them inside uh, a video player that we created. Hopefully that's an animated, oh, uh, never mind, it's a PDF. But, Picture there's depth data on the one on the right, and so we marry the two together, and then you're able to get, uh, using actually Omar Shapira, who's also at the festival, created a, uh, a disparity shader inside of Unreal, uh, Unreal Engine, uh, which we then, uh, which allows you to be able to get a sense of depth for the video. So when we place the live action video inside the game engine, 
uh, it feels like you're there with them and it feels like the video fits. Because if it doesn't, if the video doesn't fit, then it feels like you, it, if there's anything wrong with the vi vision of what you're seeing, then you can get thrown out of the experience. And, you know, as we know with keywords like immersion, you know, be, that's very paramount in VR. And as you can see also, 3D audio is very important for that same uh, idea of presence as well. You can play sounds wherever you want, move around the room, and they uh, react accordingly. And this is what the installation looks like. This is what we premiered at uh, Sundance this year. Three different chairs with, with the, uh, the tracking cameras in front of them. And that is, that is all. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm going, I'm going slideless, sorry, you're just going to get me. Um, I uh, was, so I founded the, the interactive department at the Tribeca Film Institute in 2011 and um, initially it was really, uh, it came out of running a grant, the TFNE Media uh, Fund, which the Ford Foundation had said to us, we want to explore what documentaries look like when they're not traditional documentaries, we don't know what that is. Um, but we know that consumer behavior is changing and we know that we need to reach people um, and we know that we're not going to do that by talking about it, so let's start funding some work. And in doing that, we suddenly realized that there were all these other things that we didn't really know how to do because we, I, I come from a documentary background. I didn't really know very many technologists. I didn't know a lot of designers. So that's how the department really became a department because we realized that we had to do hackathons and run workshops and start to like... Uh, create um, bridges between all these communities that I think a lot of people here are really comfortable in those intersectional worlds, but in the documentary world we were still pretty much hanging out with each other in the same festivals and the same conferences. So that's always been something that I've been really interested in actually throughout my career, but it was really only when I started working at the Tribeca Film Institute that I started to really see how that could, how that could work. And I sort of saw the interactive department as almost being like a kind of skunk works within within the Tribeca Film Institute, um, which really wasn't used to doing those kinds of projects. And we were doing everything from sort of old school transmedia to um, virtual reality. So we, um, we put some money into uh, Notes on Blindness into Darkness. And that was the first project that I think got me really, really excited about VR and storytelling. Um, because I, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it was a, pro a project that actually, even more so than the film, made me think about blindness as something other than just not seeing, like really understanding the, 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 the affordances, I guess, of blindness. And I still am really, really excited about VR and, 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 and what comes next, um, but I also am really, really worried about it because for, I think for many reasons that a lot of us are worried about it. I mean, part of it is not having the long view, which I think puts all of us in this, this endless sort of bright, shiny object moment. Um, but I actually recently moved back to South Africa and working in VR there has, <laughs> has been really, really interesting because um, there are people doing virtual reality there, but all these things that are just sort of taken for granted, like good Wi-Fi and access to being able to even order things and have them delivered a couple of days later kind of suddenly fell away. And now, I always talked about, at Tribeca, because I was working on social issue projects, I would always talk about accessibility. And I would always talk about you know, digital literacy and, and all of these things. And now I actually realize that so much of that was just lip service because I didn't really have to live it every single day. And, um, and there were projects, I mean, projects that I love, like Do Not Track, which is a project we, um, we made with Brett Gaylor on um, what we funded uh, around uh, tracking. And I tried to show that at a conference in South Africa and it just wouldn't load. You know, it was like 0%, 5%. I left it up on the screen and by the end of the session it still hadn't loaded. So, one of the things that I'm really, really interested in is the, the, the absolute latest bleeding edge technology and people who have access to that, that's all wonderful and I am excited about that too, but it's always keeping in mind this sort of full spectrum of what's possible and I love all these experiments with WebVR for example, because WebVR is actually fantastic in, in a place like South Africa where a lot of people um, will have um, smartphones but they won't necessarily um, be able to download huge 360 files. I mean, a lot of those files, you know, like they sort of start at five, 500 megabytes and you just can't download that. Um, so, I think one of my challenges now is really thinking about that. It's, it's really genuinely thinking about accessibility, not as a, like, let's think about the stuff that we can do that's sort of small and for over there, but actually, like, thinking about it in terms of how that actually creates better work across the board. Um, because that's something that I'm, I'm really finding. So I've just set up a company in South Africa, a non-profit called 
Electric South, and we're funding and incubating media, uh, non-fiction media, including VR. And the work that's coming out is incredible because people are just having to like figure out different ways of making work. Um, and I think that's super important because um, it makes the work better. I think it makes all of our work better when that is the case. And right now, in the VR world that I see it, I don't think it really is. I'm oh, sorry. Maybe that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You just jumped right in into some really good. I mean, that was. Thank you for saying all of that. I feel I feel similarly about many of those things. Um, so. Um, First off, I'd like, I'm really excited to be um, on this panel with you all. You guys are such amazing rock stars in this field. Um, and I also feel really honored to be taking the place of Kamal Sinclair from Sundance. They have they run the New Media Fund, and I know that you guys probably would have loved to hear from her. There's so many amazing things, so make sure you look up that program online because there's often calls for work, and they're really like um, doing a lot in this realm too, so don't forget about Kamal. Um, <laughs> So I started as a um, media arts director in January of this year, and um, so I work for the government. It's completely different, but before that, I did a lot of different things. Um, and I uh, came from the nonprofit field, working at Squeaky Wheel, which um, <laughs> I'm glad that you dug up that photo. I'm also slideless. So, um, so in my life before working in the government, which is a completely different space, but I just used clouds as a training material for my staff um, to talk about uh, how people are hacking connects and things like that. Because when people say the word hack in the government, they're like, oh. <laughs> they like fall over. So anyway, I'm like uh, really glad to be there to be able to do this type of education uh, because there's there's just a lot of you know, I'm talking from the funders' side, there is still a lot of confusion of what is going on in the media arts field, and I feel so lucky to have this position right now to be able to mediate the two sides. So, um, I was a co-founder of Flat Sitter, which is an artist collaborative, and we did a lot of um, work that was more like analog and digital, like weird video and sound. My background was more in experimental sound and video, so like if you're into free noise and stuff like that, let's talk later. But that was my background, was that kind of stuff. So then um, working at um, Squeaky Wheel, I was a curator and a director of programming, and then I was the executive director. And while I was doing work as an artist, I kind of realized there was this barrier of um, knowing how to use these tools that are coming out, there's always something new. And when you're an artist, you want to focus on the things that you're making and why you're making them, and you're thinking about these different pictures. But then, all of a sudden, when like a DK1 is available, you're like, well, how does that work? <laughs> so what I was seeing more and more was this gap of people who really had technical skills and artists who really just want to like experiment with things. So while I was at Squeaky Wheel, one of the last things I did before I left was um, start a residency program that paired up our Buffalo game space, which was all independent game designers. Um, and our makerspace as consultants for the Media Arts Center. So we would do, we, um, you know, right now you can actually apply if anybody's interested in this. If you're an artist, you can apply to do a residency and you'd get resources like a consultant to help you. You'd get a housing, you'd get a stipend. Um, you'd also possibly get a show at the end of that. So it was kind of like this merging of different roles because I just realized how, how difficult it is to do it all yourself, even though it's really great to do it yourself, but sometimes you need help. Um, because these are complex fields, and it's hard for somebody who's not coming from that background. So anyway, um, what, what's kind of exciting um, about that and then coming into the other side as a funder is, is like seeing how other organizations are developing new programs to work at that intersection in Tribeca. You guys did a really amazing job with that. Sundance also. Um, you have New Inc., the incubator space with New Museum. You have Ivy. So this intersection of art and technology is like sprouting up again, and I just, it's like really reflecting the 70s and 80s. We'll, we'll just do this timeline again of media arts and technology and artists informing that intersection, but it's happening again, and it's a really exciting time to be here and talk about that. Um, so what am I saying right now? I'm not sure, but I just, I just wanted to let you know that um, the NEA is onto this stuff, and I look forward to talking more about ways that we can um, help support the, the work that you guys are doing, work that you guys are doing, and um, to tell you a little bit about that. So like my special powers are the project development, fundraising, um, things like that, artists writing grants. I've sat on so many grant review panels. I love writing grants so much. That's why I have the job I have now. I will talk you here all night about grants, so whatever you want. Just seriously, um, come talk to me. Um, and that's that. <laughs>
That's a good suit to go. <laughs> wow, you love Grant, right? <laughs> so nice. Um, okay, so I have a few curated questions for our panelists. Um, some are for specific panelists, and, and others are um, for everybody, I guess, or everybody who wants to answer. Um, the first one, I think, and I keep hearing it, I mean, I just got here, you know, a couple of hours ago for the um, conference, but I keep hearing uh, people kind of complaining about um, exhibition experiences of VR, or I don't like wearing the headset, and all sorts of stuff like that. So I thought that would be a, a good place to start, is just, what are some of the challenges, um, either institutionally or um, within your own work, um, that you face when you're presenting um, VR work um, in the respective settings that you're in? Uh, I mean, just to start with like, some practical challenges, um, you know, museums, even, even the museum I work at are are used to thinking of exhibitions as um, you uh, install a thing and then leave it up and you have to do a check on it in the morning. Um, and, and, right, and, and, you know, what we learned through trial and error is that you basically, um, you have to have someone on site the entire time babys babysitting it. And that, that sounds maybe minor, but it's actually a, a very challenging, uh, practical concern when it comes to sort of budgeting and resources, you know, resources for, for that. That's, that's my first sort of answer to that question. I just, I just want to say a massive yes to that yeah. because we, so at the Tribeca Film Festival we have uh, Storyscapes which is our interactive, um, interactive immersive section of the festival, it's a juried section, and it started in 2012, we didn't have any VR that year, we, we had VR in 2013, but in 2013 Oculus actually came with the headsets and they would sit there with the headsets. It was almost kind of like, you know, an Oculus show and tell. So I didn't really think about any of the tech stuff. I just let those guys do it. And then um, this year, I mean, we just had this thing where we had, we had the guy who was sort of building out all the exhibitions and then me and my producer. And I'm pretty techie, but I didn't, I couldn't be there all the time because I was doing panels and talking about, you know, VR and making sure that everyone was happy. And everything kept going wrong. Like all the vibes, like the, the, we had this, these beautiful blue lights, which of course interfered with the, the vibe. Everything kept going wrong. Everything that could go wrong kept going wrong. We didn't have a single tech person. We just didn't, we never thought about that. Um, so I mean, that's one obvious one. And then also just audience flow and movement. Um, we, had a, we had a wait list app, which um, people were getting texts at, at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning saying that their slot was available. It was a disaster. And, um, we designed it really, really badly. And, you know, the thing is, we'd actually done a few years of VR exhibitions by that point, so I thought we were going to be okay. But I'd forgotten that VR had suddenly sort of exploded and everyone wanted to see it. Um, kind of, I guess, after the big Sundance year. So it was a disaster. And then the other, the one other quick thing I'll, I'll say is, I'm really interested in VR installations, so not just plonking a headset on someone's um, head, but actually creating a space, I think, like you had with the ASMR. Um, and that's also been quite challenging, just in terms of what you do to not interfere with, like how to make that work, because I feel like we just didn't, everyone's kind of figuring that out, like, what, does an, what does an experience, an installation experience look like with VR? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel that like pretty heavily, because there's this big question of like spectatorship or spectacle, which, you know, has become like such a kind of a joke. I don't think I, I would ever want the people uh, inside the experience to be laughed at by the people outside the experience, but that is definitely a thing. Or watching watching someone in a VR experience, like when you're a spectator, uh, that can become part of the entire thing. But I think you have to think, you have to always think outside the headset, you know, because if you're not, I think you can set up really like uncomfortable situations that might actually work in the opposite direction of what you're trying to achieve, like in that artist project. So to me, like the entire context is important, and you should always be building like out outside of the headset. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just uh, recently, I and mean, why do we have to wait in line for this thing, right? It's horrible. You're like standing there waiting in line forever. I was at a um, demo day in San Francisco at Obscura Digital, and they had some new um, technology, which was like a, a 180 dome. So it was showing sort of like 3D, or sorry, 360 actually like circular video in the dome. So it's a way to create like a shared 
viewing experience around this very isolated viewing experience that is the VR headset. Um, it was cool, but it's maybe not quite there yet. Uh, but I think that, that that balance is really delicate um, between that sort of isolating and the shared, the shared experience. And I'll just add one more thing to, I guess, two things. Uh, I think with the lines, though, you know, the, I, don't, I don't think we've ever been to a, a conference or a festival that's figured it out perfectly. I think that, you know, as we get, as, we, as the people also understand the apps better, uh, that they'll go smoother. But um, there's also an opportunity, you know, you have a captive audience, so you can also take advantage of that, you know, with, with a, some type of ancillary experience, uh, whether, you know, it's, it's some, even just something on the wall that helps describe it, other people, you know, uh, discussing the experience with them so that they can help get into the mindset, or a lot of people are doing augmented reality things when they wait. So I think that that, that problem can turn into uh, sort of a solution or something to help. Uh, also, I think, when speaking of the audience, uh, right now, you know, how many people here, and I hope, as everyone, how many people here have actually tried virtual reality? Seems like most everyone. What about augmented reality on the phone? What about head-mounted augmented reality? So not as many over that, and I think that, so, more people, in, we're sort of the minority here, but as soon as people become more acclimated to the technology, all these experiences will become smoother. I think it's also difficult to put someone into a VR experience that requires them to do too much. Right now, everyone still, it's a lot safer for them to be passive witnesses, unless you want lines to be much longer. People need time in them to acclimate themselves to these headsets. Uh, pretty soon, you know, little kids will be like, you know, jet fighters in this, wanting to be doing cuts, wanting to be changing time, move forward in space. They're not gonna get nearly as sick. So I think that time will also change this. Uh, and I think also it'll be interesting when we have installations where people have head-mounted AR demos and people are used to that. It's like five years ago. I think also the, the, the with just what you were talking about, about you, like you don't want to have people just laughing at people in, uh, in VR, which actually has been the case of a lot of exhibitions I've been to. But um, playing with that can be really, really powerful. They, they, there was a, a VR lab in Copenhagen where they had to just, they made pieces very quickly in three days. And one of them were, was just you, you would go up on a stage and everyone else was doing their, the, the audience were out there that, like looking at VR pieces and drinking and whatnot. And there was a curtain, a red curtain on the stage, and you go behind it, and then they put the mask on you. And then in the experience, you were standing on the stage, and um, the audience were applauding and waiting for you to do something. And you, you couldn't tell whether the curtain had gone up or not. So I was convinced, I was convinced that I was up on the stage with this whole audience looking at me. And it was really, really powerful. So I think playing with things like that can be really interesting. Um, but most of the time, most of the experiences I've, I've seen have got, you know, if it's a 360 experience, it's the swivel chair with the table next to it to put the headset on. And I just, it's those kinds of things that I really, really, I, I, it's, my heart sinks a little bit when I go to exhibitions like that. And I've been guilty of producing them. Can I just, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to like, I want to bring up like some really basic things like that no one's like really gotten around, which is said it's expensive, but um, it's also kind of gross. Because, like, you're all sharing this headset, right? Everyone, like, is like, oh, I gotta clean this, I gotta, like, you know, and, and, like, that, like, sharing experience could be fun in some ways, but right now it's just so awkward. Like, there's so many, just, like, I feel like it's, like, a CD. It's, like, this, like, mid, mid, at the midpoint, right? That, like, it's cool right now because it's still all about, like, the technology itself, but, I mean, we're getting out of that phase, and the, the, the accessibility financially to it, and still just, like, the accessibility of it as like an object that because not everyone can have one or they're not like in library shares, you know, where like anybody could go in and like be experiencing these projects, you do then get into all these other icky things of like sharing with all these people. And I don't know. So it's not like a one for everyone opportunity. So Yeah, and one other basic thing I want to talk about, which Ingrid ran me up, is stability. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes jealous that that like I have to think of sort of exhibitions for three months. And like I know that um, the challenges that come with sort of a weekend or a week. Um, but this is this sort of a scourge of a lot of new media art is, is like, oh, it works at the opening, so it works. And, and actually, because um, uh, I think a lot of you are probably creating VR experiences, um, stability is a very important uh, element of, of creating these things. And it's very hard and often sort of the last thing that's thought of. I'm going to jump a little out of order because of some of the things that Ingrid brought up and, and also Lauren with accessibility. And um, it was uh, very interesting hearing you talk about how VR scales when you move 
move to South Africa and you don't, the, the internet just is not going to work at the capacity that you're um, used to. But how have you all worked toward um, making projects accessible or, or how are you thinking about um, accessibility in the different contexts that you're working in and, and what do you think is maybe um, the, the future of um, accessibility in this industry? Because it's a conversation topic that seems to continue to come up. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, there, there are, there, I have 3 a.m. moments where I think of all the things I could be doing in South Africa, it really is like VR, the thing I should be doing. <laughs> uh, it does, I, I do sometimes just think, what am I doing? But I guess, yeah, you know, for the similar reason that you were talking about, sort of uh, making sure that artists are, are in the space and, and feeling comfortable with the technology, I, I think wherever VR goes and whatever it leads to, being in the space right now is interesting and I think it's really important that everyone can be in that space because we are going to be communally, collectively deciding what that becomes, right? So, um, you know, I think we're all pretty much agreed that we don't want it to just be, you know, white men in Silicon Valley deciding what that becomes. Um, but at the same time, I think it also... <laughs> that's why <laughs> Yeah, that's why. I mean, you, you know... We didn't plan that. <laughs> it's really good time. It came up early, but you know, and it's like it, it, it's sort of funny, except that it's not. And and I um I I think though that the danger is, of course, is that you sort of also forget that um it can also become um it, it's also about the rest of the world and and our stories already. And I mean, I, I work in documentary, so I, I'm really thinking about this through the documentary lens. So it's, you know, forgive me if this isn't relevant to other fields, but in the documentary world, there is still such a weird flow of information in terms of how documentaries are funded, made and seen. There's still a really weird sort of post-colonial, uh, not even post-colonial, colonial way of like, you know, people go to Africa, make films, come back and premiere them in a film festival in, in the States. And, and, and that is so dangerous in terms of how we consume stories and how we see the world. And I know that's sort of obvious to say, and it's weird that I've only, and I've always said that and thought that, but I really feel it now in my everyday practice and, and life. And, and, and so I, I guess for me, it's, it's about funding stories, um, in my case in Africa. Um, it's about trying to find talent um, and being really, really careful about curation. So really thinking about where you're looking for people and, and making sure that you're sort of supporting and incubating talent as much as you can. And then I think it's also about paying attention to the, both the hardware and the software. So for example, I'm really, really interested, and we were just having a discussion about this in web VR, because I think that that can solve a lot of the accessibility problems. And it may not be invested in so much if you're in places where you can download gigabyte files or, or get your hands on a Vive or, or a Riff really easily. So it's, it's things like that. It's, it's just paying attention to those details that you don't need to pay attention to unless you really have to. Um, and I think that that's sort of how I'm thinking about accessibility now. But, uh, but I do have to say that I, I, I also think that it's, it's really important that we don't just think about like sort of the cheap leapfrogging workaround stuff for Africa because there are lots of people making amazing work for the Vive, um, not, oh, not, maybe not lots, but there, I know people making amazing work for the Vive in Kenya, for example, and, and, um, and in South Africa and in Senegal. So, you know, this stuff's happening across the spectrum, it's just that we need that full spectrum. Uh, let me just build on that and then one other, these are just two things to check out, so if you have a pen, um, but there was an article in New York Magazine that, I don't know if you had read this one about, um, titled, In Virtual Reality, Women Run the World, and it's um, written by Dana Evans. And it kind of poses a couple interesting questions about that, like how we're keeping, how we all can, we're at a, a pretty level playing field right now, um, but I think it, a lot of the future depends on how we're consciously making sure we're integrating everybody to be in, in these conversations, which is really an exciting spot to be in. But look up that article because it, it kind of hits on some things, but also I feel like it's still a little bit blind in, one, in another area, too, in a few other areas. So anyway, that's one thing. Second thing, um, seven on seven at Rhizomes program. They um, there was a guy from White Rabbit there. I don't know if you guys Mike. remember. Mike. Mike. Yeah. And who was the person he was paired with? She was really funny. Anyway, they did this um, thing on Inside Out VR, and they have the video of their presentation on their website, but you should check out that clip because it talks a lot about the, um, the outside version of what's happening while you're inside the VR headset. 
and they actually used that image too, um, the Zuckerberg image. So it just all kind of came all into an intersection. So it's just two things to look up. Yeah, I think um, VR still is clunky. Uh, yeah, not the most hygienic experience. Um, and also, you know, it, it's in order to get a high-powered VR experience, you have it's still like an arcade or a theater. You have to go somewhere. I think as soon as these things become more inexpensive, and you know, uh, things like the cardboard are more ubiquitous, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, when we were in Europe, we just noticed that VR just hasn't really hit the same way that it has here. So I think a lot of that's also about the culture, to embrace it and to lead where it needs to go. Um, you guys have probably seen that there's numerous Facebook groups that are about VR. There's dozens. Uh, there might even be hundreds at this point you know, with thousands of members. And these communities are really good at sharing this information. As soon as something gets posted, like the NY Mag article that got sent out you know, to everyone really quickly yesterday. And so people are getting educated really quickly on this stuff. And I hope that that continues, because right now it's still very exciting. I think it also might be because there isn't, people haven't found a clear way to monetize it, so everyone's sharing this, and as soon as there's money, then maybe that will sort of start, you know, people will be more cagey about it, and I hope that doesn't happen. Um, you know, I can only, we can only sort of, I think that's also why communities like this are nice, because we can also sh shape how that's going. Uh, but as soon as things become less, you know, the, this, this form factor becomes smaller, more inexpensive, uh, connection speed becomes faster, and also the, the knowledge of how to do these things in Unreal or um, in Unity, or also how to do spherical video. It's pretty easy for someone to get started with that. Now, uh, obviously there are certain resources that you need in order to distribute, but also those things have become, you know, it's a lot more level playing field trying to put out a, a game or an experience um, than it was trying to put out a, a short movie or a feature film, you know, 10 years ago. Right, and also there are like these large industries like Discovery, when they have Discovery VR and they're sending out VR rigs to that fishing show that they, I don't know, what is that? The Greatest Catch. <laughs> anyway, the Deadliest Catch, thank you, not the Greatest Catch. I don't have you talking about pop culture. <laughs> but anyway, um, that, that's like a very important part of that because most of these, that's what's really exciting about this conference here is the community because there's this whole other community that's very VR industry based, which is all, all the commercial media. And at some point they overlap and they're, they're, right now we're all talking to each other and we're having the same conversations about stitching or um, equipment and everybody's kind of running into the same glitches. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm really glad that you said that about this, this thing when people finally start to clearly monetize that and then we have that gap again. Um, there was a woman who I was speaking to from KCRW, um, which is a radio station, and for radio stations, for them to stay relevant, they're using VR to kind of do supplemental um, radio programming. So for them, they weren't really equipped to start doing VR um, clips on their website. It's like a very popular thing for um, multi-platform radio now. And um, they were running into problems, and so they started reaching out to the local university and they started using students for interns to help them because they were really exciting about problem solving this area that their staff just wasn't equipped to do. They were focusing on so many other things. And um, what came out of that was a new position. And so the student who was an intern at one point is now working for KCRW. So um, for the students in the audience, you guys are in a very unique position to really start partnering with other um, organizations who are starting to work in this medium. For them, it's foreign and you have um, uh, a real step step up on that. Really, just one last thought. Like, yeah, because you covered so many like good points. Every single person's like going right down the line on big stuff. There's like you know there's the physical constraints, financial constraints, all these other things. But then there's like all these conceptual problems right now too. Like as things like contract and expand, because you have like kind of these like pairing offs of groups where you're like, well that's that's just marketing. You know, some people could write that off, or some other people are like, well that's just that, or that's just that, or you're just nerding out on this. Like, and I think that that mentality is actually pretty problematic, or like even just having any kind of preconception of what an appropriate space is like for having a le legit like VR experience. Like, I don't even I don't even know what that is. And I think that like the most the more flexible I think you can be, and even with artists, like artists working across like all of those like different economies, like that's really gonna, I think, start to cycle like some, some pretty interesting shit, sorry, interesting things. And, uh, and I think that, that like that flexibility and figuring out like 
as different markets working with like the same tools, like how you can start to make that more fluid and also how that trickles down or out into getting that accessible to anyone else being content makers is like gonna open it up from the inside out. Otherwise, like you're gonna keep siloing things and we're gonna have the same kind of money problem. I want to ask a question. Sorry, sorry, I just have one final thought, just because it wasn't mentioned. Ah. I'll be very brief. <laughs> Go for it. Um, just on the, on the notes of accessibility, um, just because it wasn't brought up, I think a major barrier to accessibility is still that um, VR makes women nauseous more than men significantly for some reason, and we haven't solved that, and I think that's a big barrier. It's much better things to be solved. That's all. There's a lot of things <laughs> that are that the, the history of being a priority, but um, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll move past it. Move past it. Um, so, I, yeah, I wanted to ask specifically to Kalani because the, the question of commercialization of VR came up, and you work in a commercial gallery context, and I was wondering, um, first of all, I mean, you have a challenge in, in terms of a, a collector base for new media it's still, even though we've had new media for a very long time, it's still um, a challenge for a lot of collectors to imagine what that um, looks like. And so I'm wondering, um, in, in your mind, how, how does one collect a VR experience, or how do you um, introduce a, a collector to VR as something that they would want to have ownership of in some way? Yeah, and it, I mean, it's a barrier to get one of these devices in their home as well, just because it's, you know, it's a pretty nerdy experience still. You have to custom build a computer, and you have to you know, provide a headset, and now I have a collector with a piece on the Oculus, but now, Claudia Hart is making work on the Vive, and he has to get a new headset, and he's sort of like dealing with this really intense both hardware and software dependency. Um, but uh, there are people who are collecting and living with these objects. Um, oftentimes we'll do things like I, I showed earlier where the, um, there's a sort of an artifact that's delivered with the VR experience. So in the, in the case of the Demoda, it's a 3D print of the of the pediment of the museum, and that's a, a, a unique sculpture by Alfredo Salazar Caro. Um, the divide, um, the data for the piece is actually contained in that object. Um, sometimes makes it feel a little bit more tangible to a collector. Um, we don't want to do it in a trite way, but we like to provide them something that is object based. Um, but the thing that I really love about the Demoda and many of the pieces that I support at Transfer Gallery, I think it's really important also when, with the question of distribution, right? Right now, the best way to get into people's homes and onto these devices is through, you know, one of the stores that is controlled by at the corporate level or at the, you know, manufacturer level for the different devices. So, um, you know, continuing to distribute this stuff freely, I think, is is really important. And the Demoda is available for download. Um, and they're thinking about new models for charging almost like an entry fee into the museum or a small sum to make it more accessible to a wider audience um, and still gain support. Um, so I think artists experimenting with these kinds of methods of distribution is super important, also to Lauren's point earlier, um, that we keep that interesting and not just in the hands um, of, of the corporate entities. Um, there's a lot of analogies right now for apps which are art-based. Um, there's an initiative called Art App, which is being um, championed by Paulina Babeca at uh, Postmasters Gallery, and they're petitioning Apple to have a special category for art apps in the art store. Um, but you can see, you know, there, there are certain qualifications for what gets in the app store, there are certain things that are specified about how you navigate an environment, there are certain requirements, and the more that, that artists can continue to own those methods of distribution, I think that's really important. So. Um, Part of the, the biggest part of education for my collectors is talking about how an artwork can both be distributed and also owned um, in a limited edition, and what it means to collect a work like that, um, and continue to support the development in the medium. Um, one other interesting point is that with most software pieces, um, they are iterative and they're potentially being updated and developed as hardware improves. So we have some interesting um, contracts that we produce as part of the acquisition process that talks about support from the studio for a certain period of time, um, you know, how you can have essentially the equivalent of an art handler or a, a preservationist afterwards to continue to update the format. So there's a lot of education in that regard as well that goes along um, with supporting an artist who's, who's developing work in this medium. Um, 
another, another context that a lot of um, the members of this panel are engaged in um, for, for VR is particularly storytelling. And I um, was curious about, um, you know, it's clear that um, in storytelling that new digital media opens up um, possibilities that are distinctly different from other existing media. So I'm wondering um, what for you is exciting about um, VR and storytelling? And this is specifically for Winslow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is, like, this is for you. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we talk about how there, there's an experience of, of the audience looking at the person viewing the content, and that also can be, uh, you know, with that, you want to make sure that the person inside the headset has a certain amount of intimacy, especially with Giant, we made sure that we created a space where they could feel safe to explore their emotions, because it is a heavy piece. Um, and we also wanted them to, to, you know, to be able to be acclimated to the environment, like I said before, so that they enter a dark room, they, there's one of three chairs that they can sit in, and we tell them also, we give them a, a disclaimer, you know, as a trigger warning, telling them that they're going to be entering into a basement with a family that is in an active conflict zone so that you know there's there's so that they understand what they're getting themselves into because also as VR becomes more realistic uh, especially not only with, with the, the the visual but also with the audio you know there's a chance that you can traumatize someone or if they've been in a similar uh, circumstance you can re-traumatize someone and I think VR is, is still at the level where you know we might not be quite there I think actually it has done that because we've told people this morning and then they said, you know, I actually don't need that. You know, I grew up uh, in, a, in a similar situation, you know, going into a basement with my family. I, I don't want to have to deal with that. Um, or some people saw it and they said, wow, that was way too real. Um, we haven't had anyone, like, you know, become angry with us because we, we made sure that we made that point uh, apparent in the beginning. But really being able to set the scene, I think, can, can help tell that story uh, so that you know, there's sort of a beginning, which is put, you know, before you put the headset on, the middle, which is the experience itself, and the end. And after they experience it, they take the headset off, and they get to read Elitza's director's statement, which basically, you know, it, it contextualizes the experience, letting them know that, that you know, she experienced something similar when she was a, a child, and, you know, that, that collectively, if we, you know, pass legislation or work together, we can, we can make a difference. And, and we also let them stay there for a little bit because after they experience something that is, that is so intimate, uh, you don't want to just get up or you know, flip the lights on. It's like shaking someone awake when they've been sleeping and they've been in an intense dream. And I think that these are some of the careful considerations um, to, to do right now. A lot of VR conferences, they're just folding chairs, gear VRs, and um, like headphones that don't take out any of the sound. And how are you supposed to have an intimate experience if that's the case? So I think there needs to be a lot of careful consideration into the experiential components of these of these uh, of these projects. Um, also, I think that there's something really unique about VR: the intimacy of, of the person being inside the headset that no one else can see what you're doing. So there is a certain sense of, of privacy that you can you can take yourself to another another place and be secure in that feeling. And also the fact that most VR experiences have headphones on. When people watch movies, most of the time it's with their sound system or off a laptop or in a theater. We're able to do things with audio that we haven't been able to do before. We can do whispers and we can really have a sense of someone feeling like they're right here. In movies, you have, you know, if you have a really good sound system, you might have a 5.1 or a 7.1, which is, you know, a bunch of speakers in your house, but you don't have that sense that someone's like right here and, and really close to you. So I think that with audio, we're really able to explore a sense of, of and I've said it probably four times now, uh, intimacy. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in? Because I'm actually coming at it from the complete opposite end. Where, like, I, I, am, I envision or I'm always seeking out, looking for projects that, like, in, in, enhance, like, the real world around me or play a role in, like, these larger stories where it's, it's a piece of the whole story, right? And I often find, like, I guess I, I always go back and forth, ping pong back and forth between like this really utopian like vision or like this very like sometimes I'm really introverted and I have like I really want to just be alone like you know with myself and my experience and that's great and at the other times like when I think back the other way I, I want this to be like integrated into parts of my life like where you know more of like mixed reality experiences and like what can what can that offer to actually make the other way around making connections between people you know we could we can dive off maybe 
there's some other conversation about like the empathy machine and like how is this how is this device like is it is it capable of helping us like you know see deeper into ourselves or connect with someone else to be needed necessarily for that or like when is it being employed you know and like the moment at which it's employed and how it's employed to me is how the story gets told right and think back to like the beginning of like when when film like first films came out people thought the train was like it was a real train it was coming out of the screen at them you know like. And we will numb ourselves to that experience probably very quickly. And, and so I'm always constantly thinking of the moment that I tap out, right? Or when's the moment that anyone taps out? And you're never going to have like a universal serum like, or like one, one platform that's going to always give everybody like that intimate experience. So I think it is like a, de a deployment, you know, question constantly. I think it's um, really understanding your audience. like you know, before understanding like the device and, and so on and so forth. I, I keep always jumping away from the machine. But I think it's also it's also allowing for the room and space right now for to acknowledge that a lot of this is clunky and experimentation because, you know, I mean like the whole empathy machine thing immediately just makes me kinda of go, oh because like I've heard people say, you know, VR is a an empathy machine so many times that it just it's a, like intimacy just yeah. sort of becomes just, just it's, a, it's an intimate the, uh, an intimate empathy machine. I, I think um, I think one of the problems is not that we're experimenting and maybe using these words too often. It's just that there isn't a lot of I mean, and I'm speaking maybe more from the film world. There's not a lot of critical discourse around it. So all you have is you've got like you know the Verge and Gizmodo and all those companies who are constantly talking about like the latest technology and, and, and maybe, you know, a couple of articles about empathy machines with a few quotes from like almost always the same people. It's like Chris Milk, I mean, I love all these guys' work, but it's just, it's always the same people. It's like Chris Milk, Gabo or uh, Felix and Paul and like maybe three others. And meanwhile, there's this like, whole gamut of experiments out there that aren't really being like talked about and, and discussed and, and unpacked in the ways that I think they need to, so that all of us can really sort of start to really move forward in terms of Storytelling, and I'm talking actually about both 360 video and true VR, um, because I think that in both cases we're just like using words and assuming that we all know what the other person means, and and we're also all it's like a weird thing where we're not we're not it's almost like we're not judging the work enough like it, 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 like it warrants more critical unpacking I think, um, but we're also really like um, jumping on all this work as if it's sort of fully finished and realized work, and we're in such early days. So I think what we just need is a little bit more breathing room and a lot more critical discourse. Yeah. I think it's also revealing that like, it inherently it's, it's unearthing like a problem of, of language, right? It's like trying to like address a problem of language where like multiple people can like have experiences with like a similar emotional outcome or psychological outcome or whatever, but like we're always trying, we have to, as humans put them into like spoken words and I don't necessarily think those things work very well together and I think we're constantly going to be making up words for these experiences and I think that that in and of itself is like a, a super like hindering thing but we're people that use words so like we're going to have to, that, that itself is like going to be a constant struggle and I think just being conscious that like those words like aren't defin like completely definitive like is something to just like constantly keep in your mind, like when you're experiencing something or making something. Well, but, but also, Capel is going to be has this real stake in his work, right? Capel has a real stake in defining his words and, and creating hype and, and changing the meaning of, of words that we've understood otherwise. Um, we talked a lot. <laughs> um, there's ten minutes left for audience questions. So, who has a question? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, um, I'm curious if Project Giant, um, in working with actors, was, was there a difference in you know, how you went about working with the actors for a project like this as opposed to doing like a traditional like, narrative video or any, any, anybody else inside the screen? Uh, yeah, it was more like a one act play. We had to treat it like theater. Uh, it's, at least in Giant, and some people said this is like, you know, other projects that are out there. It's a mixture between video games, cinema, and, uh, you know, immersive theater. Uh, for what we did, we, we shot the actors. We understood the, the limitations. We wanted to be able to use a video game engine so that people could be able to move around the space and have really, you know, uh, accurate audio. Um, but also we wanted to 
make sure that we had real people in there. Uh, motion capture is great. Uh, you've seen those people with have all the dots on them when they walk around the room. Uh, but the problem is that the the detail for the face. Or there's famous projects or movies that have been out there like Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, or Tintin, or Polar Express that are using similar technique or they're animated, but you can't. You have, there's an uncanny valley with it, and I'm, I'm not gonna. This is one of the conferences where I know that most people know what that means. Um, where, you know, they're, they're, there's something like strange with their eyes or, you know, like with their face that you can't relate with them as much. And I think that Pixar does the opposite where they go totally stylized and then you don't have that problem. But for us, we wanted to have real actors inside the space, uh, but there were a lot of limitations. You know, when I showed the, uh, the slide, it was only uh, eight feet wide by three feet deep because that was all, we used a 25 millimeter lens with a red dragon and that was basically the only space that we had. They also couldn't go in front of each other too much because of the depth data would sort of get, uh, there'd be issues with the capture of that. Um, also there's issues of occlusion too, being able, not being able to pick up stuff if they get too close to each other. We were looking at other options for full volumetric capture, like 8i uh, that's out there. Uh, Microsoft also has a, has a full, you know, I think 120 camera rig. And those are great, but there's also issues with that. It's, it's, it's super expensive. Um, it's, it's really, you have to have a lot of you know, GPU and CPU dedicated just to that. In fact, numerous GPUs to, in order to deal with all those pixels. Uh, and it still doesn't look fully right there's you know, vibrations and there's jaggies, as people say, around the edges. So we wanted to try to, 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 to come up with our own solution. So we worked uh, with a colorist named Juan Salvo, who's a, uh, a tech, technical producer, and we also worked uh, with Scatter uh, to create our own pipeline for this uh, inside of Unreal. But yeah, I mean, for us, being the real people, and I think that this is a problem that a lot of people are dealing with right now, and I think that maybe five or three to five years, we'll have something that can actually deal with people uh, in volumetric. I still don't think it'll be inexpensive, but I think it'll be a lot better. Other questions? In the back. So, uh, what I just said to the whole panel, uh, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, photorealistic virtual reality, something that actually looks real, versus, you know, something that's really weird and raw and surreal? Um, I'm really interested in, in the latter, actually, and I, I think when I observe the space, I'm kind of struck by how many virtual worlds we go into, which are just recreations of our own world. Even if they're putting us in impossible situations, like the HTC Vive does the, the whale. Have you guys seen the whale? Has anyone gone underwater and like seen the whale with its giant eyeball? But like, it's still just a you know recreating of a world that we all inhabit. and. Uh, when I'm thinking about artworks in VR, I'm really excited about the artists who are creating their own universe, who are maybe making departures from the paradigms of navigation that are set by video games and that sort of way of navigating virtual spaces um, and setting their own rules and just really fucking with the system. That's what, that's what really excites me. Um, I just have a quick follow on that because you made me think of something. Like, it was like, I would, my answer back to that would be like, for what purpose? Yeah. Because um, there's been a lot of studies like since I think 2000, 2010, maybe starting even earlier about like uh, schizophrenia and using like avatars in VR and, and that being employed or employed and deployed as therapy. And in that sense, I think that, that I, I would go way on the side of like photorealism and see, see what effects that has on a person um, in a positive way. On top of that, too, I think for what purpose, and then also um, we were talking about just the parallels of just um, the evolution of how film, the story on film, and then all of a sudden we have um, experimental film and people really messing with that structure. Um, I'd like to see more of that, too, so I, I think it really depends on what you're doing and also the VR world and the headset world, those are just tools, so imagine those as new tools that you can combine with other tools um, and really starting to break out of that shelf. And I, I think that's going to be a, an exciting space to experiment once, once people might get acclimated to the technology and those hurdles. But, you know, you can um, connect an Oculus Rift to an, a, like an analog synthesizer and you can do live video processing in that headset, right? It's just, it's just electronics, so. I, mean, I, I think that, um 
I, I think again, I mean, I keep talking about, I, I think I'd say spectrum as much as you say intimacy. I, 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 lo I love that you can do all of these things. I mean, I think some of the medical stuff around, um, you know, burn victims and the, the, that ice game is incredible. Um, I, 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 um, I'm super claustrophobic. I mean, I, I'm actually really claustrophobic in VR, but it's making me less claustrophobic. Um, so I, I'm really interested in all of those things. I think, I think playing with the medium is really interesting though. So like something like the machine to be another, um, which actually allowed you to look at someone else's hands and sort of inhabit someone else's body um, was a really powerful experience for me and made me super claustrophobic with really. um, it's, it's like I was trapped in someone else's body. Um, and um, irrational exuberance, I don't know if any of you have played that, but like, I thought that was such an amazing experience of sort of like smashing things in space and there wasn't really a story there, but I, I am so interested in how actually some of those things come together and I think volumetric video for that reason is really interesting to me because you can bring some of, some of the photorealistic imaging, um, or volumetric imaging, and then put it in a, you know, Unity or Unreal or whatever, and, and really like mess with that, and I think that's super, super interesting. So I really love, and then of course with mixed reality coming, um, you'll be able to do that, but in your living room. So I think these things are all really interesting. Um, but one thing I, I just want to say really quickly is I do think with 360 video, we haven't even sort of begun to see what you can do with that. I mean, right now it's sort of fade up, scene, fade down, don't move the camera, you'll make people sick. Um, I'm so interested to see what filmmakers are going to do with 360 video. I'm not, I'm not ruling that out either. In the back. Um, are there any particular things that seem on the horizon that are especially dangerous, terrible, obnoxious that you're worried about, that you should also worry about? <laughs> I like this question. <laughs> All of them. I was just, I was, I was, uh, here. I heard a, a talk from a lawyer who was talking about the legal implications of VR. Like, if you're swinging an HCC Vive wand and you hit someone, is that a tort? Like, are you, you know, can you actually be liable for the damage you would cause in that virtual space? And also psychological damage, as you were sort of touching on, like, when you're inhabiting an avatar, how much is that you and where does personhood get identified? So I think there will be a whole new realm of, of legal laws around, or, or, you know, legal ramifications around this. Um, and also just like the, I don't know, I have this vision um, of, of people just like hurting themselves and so many injuries. And just like what, what happens to your body in that space could have pretty widespread implications. I think that in the Sundance New Frontier program right now, there was an artist, yeah, I don't know if you know this artist, um, that was going to wear a VR headset for mm, 30 days. 30 days, was it? Okay, I was thinking it was a lot, but 30 days, and they were talking about the implications of what that would do to him, so he's going to live with it on him the whole entire time, so um, that would be something to look up as well, because it, there's going to be some crazy stuff that come out of that. I also think that it, it sort of, we fear all these things of like, what if it's too real? Like, it's not going to be too real, but it could be, you know? <laughs> it could get there, and if it is, then we're like, it's too real now, what if we, we were so wrong, we were so stupid. You know, like it's it's this thing of like of not of being afraid of the future. I think that also the fear of what it could be is something that could be holding us back from these things. But you know, I guess the reason why we should be doing these things is something that we also need to be looking at. Uh, and also, you know, for for augmented reality with certain technology that are coming out now, that could be convincing people of things that aren't real. And that could there's a lot of you know consequences with that. Um, as I said before, you know, tra traumatizing somebody or harassing people in a virtual world. Uh, you know, when we get, when, when these experiences are well connected to people across the globe, there could be a huge chance for, for trolls to, to really wreak havoc. So, yeah, I mean, there are, there are going to be problems, but, you know, that happens just like, I, I think that we have to know that with something that has the power to, to take you somewhere, that it can take you anywhere, and that those places might not always be, have the best intentions. Yeah, I was like, add some meat to that sandwich, which is, uh, <laughs> there's, there's so much in it. Um, so, is a, uh, alright, hold on, let me get my thoughts together. Uh, okay, so I, like, I'm always like, what's the military doing with this stuff? And so, mixed reality, right, like, um, eye tracking, like, there's like so many things that I just, when I can't sleep, I'm like, what? I bet they're doing that. But they did that a long time ago. <laughs> Do 
doing that right now, we, like, I don't know, like, I, and I don't know, I mean, like, well, I'm also not an expert in, in that direction, but it's definitely something that, like, you know, pops up in, in my thoughts, and, and I'm, I'm actually the most excited about mixed reality platforms, which is maybe why I'm also the most terrified of them, so, that's one. I would add something. I, I think the assumption that um, being able to stand into the, the world or the position of someone else would, would suddenly mean that you would completely understand them and have empathy for their experience is, um, a, it, I would say, is a dangerous uh, possibility or, or potential misconception of um, a lot of this technology, especially because a lot of these things were said about first-person video games. Like, um, we, we now know that uh, we are fully capable of, of, of shooting lots of people <laughs> in, a, in a video game, despite the fact that we're embodying somebody that we might not agree with. So, um, yeah, I think the, the question of, of whether or not um, this type of embodiment will um, mean that suddenly we, we gain deeper understanding of other people's experiences is a, a, a dangerous line to walk. Um, and I got to say the last thing. <laughs> um, uh, it, we're out of time and we will get kicked out of this room. So thank you so much for coming and thank you to all the panelists.